Welcome to the Answers Institute webinar series on response to intervention. The Alice Neely Special Education Research and Service Institute is part of the College of Education at Texas Christian University. The Answers Institute strives to provide high quality professional development for teachers and school leaders. This webinar, supported by the Morris Foundation of Fort Worth, is meant to further your professional development. We hope you enjoy it. The topic of this webinar is the role of progress monitoring in an RTI model. The webinar features Dr. Lindy Crawford, Associate Professor and Ann Jones Endowed Chair in Special Education at Texas Christian University. Hi everyone, thanks for joining us today. Usually I, um, I host and I don't necessarily present, so this is new for me. Um, today we're going to be speaking about progress monitoring and in its role in response to intervention. There's my contact information. If you'd like to email or call, please do so. So first I'd like to begin by placing progress monitoring in context. Um, it's just one piece of the RTI puzzle, if you will. And in a typical assessment cycle, we begin with asking ourselves, what do we want students to learn? In, in progress monitoring in particular, uh, we need to look at the entire course at the secondary level or the entire year's curriculum at the elementary level. So what do we want our students to learn across the entire year or in, across the entire content domain? The next question we as good teachers ask is how do we know if our students are learning that material? And in an RTI model and in our traditional models, we used to use these measures as well, we look at annual measures, uh, for example, statewide um, achievement tests, quarterly measures or benchmarks, lots of districts are using quarterly benchmarks now, and classroom-based assessments. And those measures actually inform us if we, um, how well our students are doing in the curriculum. And then the next question in the assessment cycle is, what do they do if they aren't, what do we do if they are not learning the information? And in an RTI model, uh, we intervene. And we always intervened as teachers in a more traditional model, but the timing of our intervention wasn't as uh, quick as it is in an RTI model. And this is where progress monitoring fits in. We progress monitor in order to measure the effectiveness of our interventions. And oftentimes we use CBMs to measure that progress or curriculum-based measures. We don't have to use curriculum-based measures, but because they're sensitive and they're brief and they have strong amounts of reliability and validity, we quite often use curriculum-based measures. So this is just the typical assessment cycle that we have used for since the beginning of time, uh, since we all started teaching and, and before then. But what we're talking about today is just this role here of progress monitoring and how important that is in an RTI model so that we can intervene, we can measure whether or not our interventions worked, and then we can get students back into the typical or the more traditional assessment cycle. So what is progress monitoring? Progress monitoring um, can be thought of as formative assessment. It's certainly not summative in nature. In the past, we relied more on summative assessments. A student failed a course in high school or a student um, didn't progress to the next grade in elementary school, and those are very summative in nature. Progress monitoring is formative, it's ongoing, um, another way of thinking about it is database decision making. So uh, in a progress monitoring model, we collect data frequently and we make decisions based on the data frequently instead of waiting until terms end uh, or the end of the year. Let me give you a couple more examples of what I mean by traditional versus progress monitoring. Um, in a traditional testing cycle that I was trained in and probably many of you, we taught and then we tested and we tested to see if students learned what we had taught. Um, if they did, we taught some more, uh, some different content and then we tested to see if the students mastered that content. 
Our question was, did students learn what was taught during a particular lesson or during a particular unit? And as you can hear in my voice, that was very summative in nature. In progress monitoring, we probe frequently to monitor students' progress in the entire year's curriculum or at the secondary level within a particular domain, for example, Algebra 1 or Biology, Calculus 1. In a progress monitoring model, we use brief timed probes to measure those students' progress. And quite often, curriculum-based measures are used because they are brief and they are timed. And the probes, or the measures, represent a sample of the entire year's curriculum, even material that hasn't been taught yet. And so, as you can tell, that's much different than our traditional way of assessment after we had taught the material. And let me show you an example of why we probe students on material that they haven't even been taught yet. In a traditional model, we teach and then we measure at time one. And what we're measuring, really, is how well did we teach that material. So if you look at this axis as being um, accuracy percentages, uh, and this uh, graph as being one student's performance, on time one, or unit one, that student achieved 80% accuracy. And really, uh, as we know, we always are trying to teach to 70, 80, 90% accuracy. So if we teach well, then this graph shows us just that. Uh, we teach four units, and in each of the four assessments at the end of the units, the student earned an 80%. So you can see here that there's really no reason to graph, and this is why we never graphed. Um, in the traditional um, instructional setting, we didn't use graphs because you can just show this on a table, and it would provide the same information. And a progress monitoring chart or graph, if you look at these four data um, series, you can see that at the end of every unit or week um, of instruction, the student's data is again graphed uh, at the end of week one, two, three, and four. But instead of a flat line, if you will, of consistently good uh, performance, this graph shows um, consistently strong progress over time in a much larger domain of material. So the content here is not just week one content. It's eight weeks of content, but we're probing, we're creating random um, items from those eight weeks, and we're creating measures from those items, and then each week as we teach more and students learn more, you should see an increase in their progress over time. This is a, a traditional trend or slope of a typically performing student. We would expect to see, with the passage of time, kids getting smarter or learning more. This is an important piece of progress monitoring in an RTI model because so many of the decisions we make are based on a normative sample. We, we um, compare the progress of certain students to the progress of their typically performing or progressing peers. So if we don't see this slope of progress, then we become concerned about students, and then we know that our interventions uh, may not be as effective as they need to be. And I can talk more about that later. So why do we progress monitor? We progress monitor in order to measure the effectiveness of our interventions. And that um, hopefully was clear in the cycle of assessment I showed in the first slide. We also progress monitor to make timely decisions based on student progress and response to interventions. And it's really the timely decisions that we're concerned about here, the formative assessment piece. The, um, one of the strengths of an RTI model, if implemented correctly, is that we can identify student um, areas of um, weakness early, and we can intervene often, early and often. And these interventions then um, need to be measured. And so um, that's why we use progress monitoring. Um, also, progress monitoring measures are very sensitive to student growth. And um, I won't have time to go into this uh, 
concept today, but the big idea that might help you understand what I mean by sensitive to student growth is that um, a traditional measure, for example, in writing, we may use a written language rubric. And the rubric may have four levels, um, beginning, um, I don't know, progressing, um, mastered, uh, you know, Excel. I mean, those are terrible levels, but you get the idea. And so students have four levels in which they can progress on this rubric. Well, that's not very sensitive if you think about a student who's making very small gains or very little progress, but that student is making progress. And so what I mean by that is if that student achieves a one on that rubric in September of 2013, it may very well be that the same student receives a one December of 2013, although their writing may have actually uh, increased over time. But because it takes so much improvement to jump up an entire uh, level on the written language rubric, you may not be able to capture that growth. So progress monitoring measures uh, are sensitive to student progress. They are, they are created in a way that will capture small increments of student growth. And another reason is they are predictive of future achievement. And time and time again, research has supported um, the predictability of um, progress monitoring measures on both instructional outcomes and uh, including statewide assessments. So here's just a, a little graph of um, a correlation between this statewide test, which is actually the Oregon statewide achievement test, and a mathematics CBM down on, on this uh, axis that was created by, by a team of us at University of Oregon. And the math CBM was only 15 items. And in, it was, I think, I think it was about 20 minutes long. And we were able to predict students' performance on the Oregon Statewide Achievement Test at about a little, a, a little under 0 .80 correlation. Uh, a perfect correlation, as many of you know, is a straight line. And so to be able to say this 15 or 20 item test predicted student performance on the Oregon Statewide Achievement Test in Mathematics, which was multiple items, multiple hours long, uh, with this much uh, confidence shows, uh, gives you one example of what I mean by the predictive relationship between these two um, measures. And then here are just some articles. There are many articles written on this um, uh, on this uh, relationship between progress monitoring measures and statewide test scores. And since many of you are concerned with students' performance on statewide tests, you can use curriculum-based measures and other progress monitoring measures to predict how well your students will do on those tests later on. Most recently, in the Assessment for Effective Intervention, Evelyn Johnson and her colleagues pu published an article that showed the relationship, the correlation between curriculum-based measures in algebra and students' performance on the Idaho standardized assessment tests. And that was seventh and eighth grade students. And that correlation isn't quite as strong, but that's a moderate correlation, a moderate to strong if you take into account you're looking at a 15-minute measure versus a statewide test. Some of the original work in this area was conducted by Dr. Ronald Good, the creator of the Dibbles um, assessments. And he found that 89% of students who read 40 correct words per minute in the spring of first grade passed the state assessment in fifth grade in reading. I mean, that's a lot of years later, right? And to be able to, to make that statement in your building or in your district um, is really, I think, powerful data for teachers and for school leaders. 
And then, of course, I had to cite myself, because that's what uh, I, we academics do. Um, we did a study in 2001 um, on second grade reading rate, and what I found is that 82% of students reading below 50 wor 54 correct words per minute failed the state math test in third grade. So instead of looking reading and, and reading, or math and math, I actually looked at reading and math reading in second grade and mathematics in third grade. And then there's a, a reading to reading um, correlation at the bottom or prediction. So it's very predictive, uh, progress monitoring measures, especially curriculum-based measures on long-term achievement. So those are some reasons why we progress monitor. Next, I'd just like to just briefly talk about when. Um, when we progress monitor depends on the extent of students' interventions. So if a student's receiving a Tier 2 intervention, then we progress monitor less frequently than if they were receiving a Tier 3 intervention, but more frequently than if they were receiving a Tier 1 intervention. So there's no um, rule, and there's actually no um, rule, kind of black and white rule, for how often you progress monitor even within tiers. Some districts may um, encourage you to progress monitor every three weeks or for, for students who are receiving a Tier 2 intervention. Or some districts may um, recommend that you progress monitor every six weeks for students receiving a Tier 2 intervention. There's really no uh, hard, fast rule across districts, but there is kind of a rule with uh, across um, the model in terms of Tier 1, Tier 2, and Tier 3, and when you progress monitor. As students receive uh, more frequent or intensive interventions, the measurement of their progress also becomes more frequent. So that's the point I'm trying to make here, is as the level of intensity of the interventions increases, so does the frequency of the progress monitoring. Here's, um, here's an example, a visual, of what um, I just explained. And uh, I'll kind of use my pointer here to walk through it. At, at Tier 1, typically, in a typical RTI cycle, we're measuring students three times per year, in the fall, in the winter, in the spring. And this is typically the entire student population. So whether or not it's in your entire district, your entire school, or maybe all of the third graders in your school. Whatever the student, however the student population is defined, you measure that entire population fall, winter, and spring. And again, you want to use benchmarks or brief measures to collect this data. Sometimes these screening measures will be uh, more complicated and more comprehensive than the frequent probes used at levels two, uh, tiers two and three. Um, so these may be like NWEA or a MAPS test or something like that and give you richer data and may take longer. Or it, you may use brief curriculum-based measures in your district or your school. And this may be in all subject areas or in identified subject areas. Most schools are at the place now where they're um, they're collecting screening data fall, winter, and spring on all of their students in key uh, content areas. This, sec this um, second group here shows the strategic group of uh, students receiving strategic interventions or students receiving Tier 2 interventions. And we generally progress monitor with these students monthly or some districts progress monitor twice monthly or some districts progress monitoring every, uh, every six weeks, like I had said on the last slide. There's no absolute rule that for students receiving a Tier 2 intervention, you must monitor them monthly. Um, I really appreciated our last speaker last month, Kathy Youngahan, who, who I think really stressed this point nicely, that in RTI, there's very few hard, fast rules that oftentimes it's very contextually driven. And I think if we remember the key to RTI is meeting the needs of individual students, 
then our measures, just like our interventions, will vary according to student needs. And then this last group here, this, is, uh, this represents students re measures for students receiving Tier 3 interventions. And oftentimes, schools choose to progress monitor these students uh, weekly. And so these are the students re receiving intensive interventions. And um, therefore, they might be receiving an intervention three to five times a week for 30 minutes a day. Um, and it may be a fairly complex intervention. Um, in that sense, we need to measure the effects of this intervention more frequently as well. Now, I will say in my professional opinion and my um, teaching experience that I support weekly monitoring of students at Tier 3 and no more than that. Some districts are measuring students uh, every day. Some districts are measuring students receiving a Tier 3 intervention uh, twice weekly. And, um, and I don't support that. And my reasoning is that uh, these students are receiving Tier 3 interventions because they're not progressing in the general ed curriculum. They're not moving very quickly, if you will. And um, I just don't think that you'll see enough growth in two days' time or one day time to spend that very important instructional time uh, testing them daily or, t or twice weekly. So that's the overview. And then um, beginning with the next slide, I believe it is, um, I'll talk about progress monitoring then at each tier, tier one, tier two, and tier three. And it might be a good time to ask if there are any questions at this point, Jacqueline. I don't have any questions at this time, but I'm sure okay. some will come in at the end. Okay, thanks, just side check. Actually, I just need to sneak a drink of water. So uh, tier one intervention, or tier one progress monitoring measures, again, if you think back, tier one is screening data. And so screening data is all the students in your student population. And it's uh, checking, uh, checking the pulse of the student's progress, right, or taking their temperature. It's a very um, a gross measure of how your entire student population is doing. These are not necessarily used for diagnostic reasons. Uh, we don't use screening data then to develop an intensive intervention to, to provide to the students who did not fare well. Instead, uh, these are very important, especially as a classroom teacher whole group, but probably even more important for somebody at the building level to see how all the students are doing across grades and within grades. So here's an example of how you might display that data and think about that data. Um, and this axis is the correct words per minute. And then here is the number of students who read this quickly and accurately in a one minute timing. This is an actual data set from a few years ago that I collected. So here uh, you can see the students are pretty normally distributed, which generally if your student population is large enough, you'll find that. Now I think the warning for administrators is that your students may be normally distributed, but they may be at the low end of the scale when compared to national norms or district norms. So um, you want to think about where they are and then what does the distribution look like. And another way of looking at that distribution is a box plot. And I have a feeling there's somebody out there when I clicked on this uh, little graph that their heart just stopped for a split second because um, it may remind you of um, your old statistics class. And it's hard to talk about assessment without um, providing some descriptive statistics. But let's just walk through this quickly if you're one of those people. So in a box plot, this line here is your median score, which tells us that 50% of the students scored below this line and 50% of the students scored above this line. And that's really important. It isn't your mean, but it's your median. And so another way of saying that is this is the 50th percentile. This here, the bottom of the box plot is the 25th percentile. The top is the 75th. The end of the whisker here is the 90th percentile, generally, and this represents the 10th percentile. 
Now, we don't know how many kids are in here. I was sharing this with a friend the other day, and she wanted to know if the wider your box plot, the more amount of students were in there, and the skinnier your box plot, the fewer students. doesn't mean that. It just happens to be this wide. But it does tell us that this is a median, and all this box plot really is, is this bar graph turned on its side. And you can see here, it's normally distributed. Okay, so, but these little dots here, these outliers, they do represent students. And so each one of these kids above the 90th percentile is a living, breathing student, and down here below the 10th percentile. And it's these outliers that we're most concerned about in an RTI model. And I'll just tell you a little story here. Let me check my time. I'll tell it quickly. Um, uh, some districts don't really like the um, triangle um, model of RTI that we've shared in other webinars, but instead they like to think of RTI as a diamond shape because then if the RTI triangle becomes a diamond, then we also take into account the kids at the top of the diamond and the kids at the bottom of the diamond. And some people, understandably so, worry that RTI has shifted focus completely away from the students who also need intensive support, but at the other end of the spectrum. So as a building leader, if I had this data, I would know that my data is fairly normally distributed. There's the median. And, um, and that scores are pretty close together. And that I have some kids out here I'm worried about. And then what it doesn't tell me, though, is how many kids are between this 25th and 10th percentile. I would actually have to look at the individual scores to get that data. So here's Tier 1 data across grades, looking at it another way. And we're going to look at 9th, 10th, 11th, and 12th graders. And this, too, is actual data. Um, and here's the scale, uh, 0, 30, and 60. And co for conceptual purposes, this could be a raw score. It could be a standard score. It could be percent correct score. Um, but basically, whatever score it is tells us about these box plots. And the blue box plots 9th grade, 10th grade, 11th grade, and 12th grade. So as a, a building leader, what I know right away is that my students are performing better at 12th grade than they are at 9th grade, because if we look at the average student score, we see that right away. Um, and we see that we don't have a bunch of students under the 10th percentile, which is great. Um, and we see that there's very little variability. That's, this is tiny because that means there's not much variability in the scores. Um, in the scores between what makes the 25th percentile and what makes the 10th, and that's important. Um, and that's kind of the big idea. So that's fall data, screening data. And then you collect the data in the winter because progress monitoring data in an RTI system, you collect screening data for tier one, fall, winter, and spring. So here's your winter data, and you look at things like, did ninth graders do better? Yes. Did 10th graders? Yes. 11th? Yes. And even though 12th did better and grew between fall and winter, they actually underperformed 11th grade, uh, which I love because I think it, it, it's so true for those of us who are in schools a lot that it doesn't surprise me that 12th graders outperformed the 11th graders. Uh, during the winter measurement system or measurement period. And the same thing happens in spring. But you can see these kids are growing. The 50th percentile is this line. The average student is improving every semester, fall, winter, and spring, as a group. So the average is moving up. So some of you are probably saying, um, why is this important? What if I'm a classroom teacher? Where does this fit in? And that's why I'd like to introduce Tier 2 progress monitoring and how why those normative data are so important at Tier 1. Same group of kids, same fall data set, winter and spring. And now here's Emily, let's say. And here's Emily's growth over fall, winter, and spring. And you can see that Emily is making pretty nice growth. She has a nice trend line, if you will. And we're collecting data on Emily monthly 
because she's at Tier 2. And in the fall, she started a little above the 25th percentile. But when we collect Emily's data in the winter, now let me again stress that you're collecting data all along these points for Emily because she's at Tier 2. But when we look at Emily compared to her peers in the winter, we can see that Emily has fallen below the 10th percentile. So even though as an individual she's made nice growth, she is not making typical or average growth for a 10th grade student. Uh, if she was, she would have stayed at the 25th percentile. And then in the spring, she's fallen even lower. Her peers are basically outperforming her, outprogressing her across time. This is important data. This is why we collect progress monitoring data in an RTI model. And I don't know if anyone has called in today uh, that feels uh, the way I did at one point in my teaching career. Uh, I remember thinking, well, I'm collecting all this data, uh, but I don't really know what to do with it. I don't really what, know what it means in context. I'm just trying to provide today a very general overview of why, when, and where, uh, for what purpose do we collect data. And you can see here, if you look at it in this sense, then it starts to make sense. And RTI oftentimes is um, implemented in a normative fashion. And so you need to know the rate of Emily's peers. And here is the trend line of a typical performing 10th grader at the 50th percentile. And you can see here the gap is this wide, but by the end of the year the gap is this wide. So really a good RTI model, what it does is it su it's successful in taking individual students' trend lines and decreasing the distance between where they are and where their peers are. At the very least, we want to make sure that Emily's making the same rate of progress as her peers, even if her performance started much lower. Okay, so finally, in Tier 3, uh, student receiving a Tier 3 intervention, her trend line may look like this. And it's um, the same kind of uh, performance scale. And then, but you can see here we're collecting weekly data instead of monthly data. And she has a nice line of progress as well. But in the, in the last slide, you know, uh, 28 or maybe 25 was the 25th percentile, which is pretty low. Here, uh, Lacey starts at zero, which is very low, and she's not close to the 25th percentile by the end of the year. Now, in, in reality, we're not waiting until the end of the year on either Emily or uh, Lacey. In reality, we're intervening here to get this trend line boosted up where it needs to be. That's the whole point of RTI, is to catch these kids early. And if whatever intervention we're using isn't effective, to change that intervention, and as Kathy Youngahan said in our last session, either increase the duration, increase the intensity, or increase the frequency of that intervention so that her trend line uh, changes direction. And you don't know whether or not to do that unless you collect progress monitoring data. So it may be that after nine weeks of intervention and along the way here, at least two different interventions have been tried, that Lacey is just not making the progress that's uh, even somewhat typical to her peers. And you've implemented two or three interventions uh, over a period of time, and she's already received Tier 2 interventions. So what do you do in that situation? In that situation, a lot of times that cues you to refer the student for additional testing. Um, and that may be testing for special education services. It may be testing around uh, language or language proficiency. It may be testing for vision and hearing. But basically, uh, as a teacher, you've tried these targeted intensive interventions. You have data to show that the, the, they weren't effective at Tier 2. 
And then when you increase the stakes at tier three and the frequency and the duration, the complexity and comprehensiveness, they still weren't effective. Then you have enough data to make a recommendation for additional testing. And this is where I'd like to just talk a little bit about um, the concept of a dual discrepancy model. This, up until this point, I have been talking about students in the general education curriculum. Um, now I'm going to shift gears a little bit because Lacey may be one of those students who you would refer for special education testing. And in the reauthorized IDEA, it says that um, if you use an RTI model, you need to show a dual discrepancy. Students need to have both a performance, a, a point in time performance discrepancy, and a progress over time discrepancy. That um, students may start lower than their peers, but if they can progress at a rate similar to their peers, then they would not qualify as uh, having a learning disability. Very important point. So I borrowed um, uh, some information from um, Lynn and Doug Fuchs, who are the directors of the National Student National Center on Student Progress Monitoring. And this is actually from a, a system they call database progress monitoring. And I just think it's a really nice illustration of the dual discrepancy model. So here they have a classroom data set, Mrs. Smith actually, and here are her scores, or the student scores, and they're ranked order from highest to lowest, except Icon's not really a student. Their growth is right along here, and you can see that even though students are rank ordered on performance score, that doesn't necessarily mean that they've grown in the exact same rank order over time. So this is one week's worth of growth. Um, typically what the Fuchs have found is that kids will grow about one uh, correct uh, pro problem per week in a curriculum-based measurement system. Uh, that's kind of an average growth. So here are the kids' growth scores. And then here are the average scores of that data set. 39 and a half is the, is the average or the mean score. 12.6 is a standard deviation, which is just uh, which just means that students performing below 26.9 because that's one, that represents one standard deviation below the mean of 39.5. Students performing at 26.9 or below have a discrepancy. They're one standard deviation below the mean of a typical performing student. The average slope of the students in the classroom is about one problem per week, which is what's been found in the literature. The standard deviation is about a half a problem, and the discrepancy criterion is plus 0.45, and it's just, again, the mean minus one standard deviation. This is the area of concern, anyone performing less than one standard deviation below the mean. So the report that their program generates then is which of those students in the previous slide have both a score discrepancy and a slope discrepancy. And they tell us here that Anthony has a score discrepancy of 19, and Erica of 18, and Anthony's slope is 0 0.05, and Erica's slope of progress is 0.23. So to go back to this, what we're looking at is anybody under 26.9, because that was the mean, and we identify all of these students, I think there are five, but we also need to identify out of those five students who had a progress or a trend or a growth discrepancy of less than 0.45, because remember that's one standard deviation below the mean, and we see that even though Amanda, Jonathan, and Michael all had low performance scores, 
and Adam all had low performance scores, none of them had a progress score less than one standard deviation below the mean. So the only two people that qualify as having a dual discrepancy are Anthony and Erica. And those are the two people then who would um, uh, have the data necessary to begin a discussion about more testing. That um, because they started low and, and even with intensive interventions, they didn't make growth typical of their peers then we have enough data to have a further conversation. So um, big ideas, I hope the takeaways of this webinar are that, is that uh, progress monitoring is an essential piece of the puzzle. It's not the only piece. And if we get too caught up in assessment, then we forget the essence of RTI, which is um, ensuring that all students receive the instruction and the interventions they need to progress in the curriculum. Um, but we don't know if those interventions are effective unless we collect progress monitoring data. The second takeaway is the frequency and the specificity of the measures used in progress monitor, monitoring vary according to the level of intervention received by the student. Students at Tier 2 will complete progress monitoring uh, measures less frequently than students at Tier 3, but more frequently than students at Tier 1. And these progress monitoring measures should be aligned with the general education curriculum. Didn't talk about that a lot, but that's an important point. A third takeaway from this webinar is that in order to use data effectively, it's important to understand the big picture, the tier one box plots, if you will, as well as the needs of individual students. It's impossible to measure whether or not students are making adequate progress or whether or not their intervention is catching them up if you don't have an idea of what typical performance looks like. The only thing I talked about today was normative performance. Um, you could also use criterion referenced measures where there's a set accuracy, like 80% accuracy, there's a set standard score, for instance, in a state assessment that many state assessments are results are reported in standard scores. Um, it could be a benchmark, a set benchmark regardless of how well the students in your building are doing on the Dibbles, for example, we know there's a fall, winter, and spring benchmark, and that's what we're using. But we have to have a measuring stick to know what typical is so that we can evaluate the progress of each of our students. Maybe another takeaway point is that, um, no, I'll let that one go. So here are some uh, resources. There are some progress monitoring websites available to you. There's one um, called Doing What Works, and it's out of the um, Department of Education. Uh, many of you have probably heard of the What Works Clearinghouse. Well, Doing What Works is far more teacher friendly. And on this website, they provide um, um, short videos on progress monitoring and uh, delivery of effective interventions and aspects, various aspects of an RTI model. They provide teachers actually teaching Tier 2 interventions and Tier 3 interventions and lesson plans and um, other information. The National Center for Progress Monitoring is a wonderful resource. Um, to learn more about the measures that have been researched to be reliable and valid to use in your system. Ames Web, some of you may be using already, is uh, less informational, but it's a, it's a system for progress monitoring. So you would um, buy a subscription for your school or your district, and then you could monitor students' progress using Ames Web Measures. It's all online, so uh, teachers aren't tasked with doing a lot of extra graphing and data collection. 
There's another product called EasyCBM out of the University of Oregon, and um, it's actually free at this point. Um, students can complete progress monitoring measures online in mathematics, and then the reports will be automatically generated. And then in reading, some of the measures are um, downloadable, but because the measures are uh, given by an administrator, um, some of those measures aren't all online. But all you need to do is sign up for a free um, account on EasyCBM, and all the progress monitoring measures are yours. And 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 it it is it does have um, reliability and validity data associated with the series of measures, um, and so um, they've been tried and tested and uh, psychometrically validated. Another um, place to find good. Uh, resources is Intervention Central, and um, many of you have probably visited there already, and they also have the CBM Warehouse, where you can download measures to use and graphs to use, and they actually have a chart dog graphing tool right online that sometimes I have students use. Another wonderful research, resource is the Florida Center for Reading Research and Dr. Torgensen and his colleagues. And the National Center on Response to Intervention, um, a little bit different than the National Center for Progress Monitoring out of a different university and more focused on RTI in general, or I shouldn't say in general, but m more comprehensive RTI. Another resource that I don't have time to walk through today, but I think a, a takeaway for you is this um, graph and actually all the different conventions labeled um, to just think about um, when you need to graph individual student progress or when Ames Web provides you with a graph and you're trying to get through it. So individual data points and then this is the student, um, this is the line of progress we want the student to travel and this is the actual trend line of the student data. And it's a nice example of what I talked about earlier. When you see the students not staying on trend and not achieving at the rate they need to achieve, then this is when you intervene. You have some intervention lines and you need to try something different. So that's all I have. I'm, I'm thinking there might be some questions, but um, that's my goodbye slide, scuba diving. Um, I, uh, as much as I enjoy being here, that's a great place to be right there. And my email um, is there for you to contact me as well. Thank you. Thank you for viewing this presentation of the Answers Institute webinar series on response to intervention.